Thank you for joining the chat room. Barbados has been promoting its new work stamp visa that allows persons, once they qualify, to stay in the country for up to a year. On Monday, July 20th, the government of Barbados published an online application form for the work stamp visa. King Chrysalis on Twitter was one of the first persons to point out the application requirements were not LGBTQ plus friendly. The way it was written, it basically disqualified persons filing for their spouse if they were in a same-sex marriage. The conversation about the policy discrimination against LGBTQ plus persons continues throughout the day on social media platforms. It took part, I took part sorry, in the conversation and shared my disappointment at the policy on my social media. So today we have with us Peter Wickham from Cadros. Hi, Peter. We have Maria Fontenelle from ECAID, which is Eastern Caribbean Alliance for Diversity and Equality. She's the communication specialist there. Hi, Hi. Maria. Right. And we have Michael Rapley from EK, not ECAID, Equals Barbados. Hi, Michael. Thanks for having me. Right. So before we get into the conversation, I just want to mention as well, there was an article penned by uh, Darian Aaron that spoke to, I think he's from the blog Living Out Loud, that spoke to the work stamp visa as well. And basically saying that the visa disqualified LGBT persons from taking part um, in this work stamp. And then we had the prime minister addressing the whole topic on the 21st of July in parliament saying that, you know, Barbados does not discriminate. And the language on this application has since changed. So Peter, I'm gonna start with you. And I know that actually today I read an article that you were sharing your views on it. So we will just start here with what were your original thoughts on the application form when you first saw it? Yeah. Well, no, I saw the, the comment um, by Ronald King, really. That was the first time I saw the reference to it being um, anti-LGBT. And I, at the time, I, I, I saw it and I just essentially looked over it because my assumption was that clearly this could not be correct. Uh, it took me a couple of days and I only then looked at the website myself and I saw the page. And I realized that it did say what it was supposed to have said. And not that I just disbelieved anyone, but I just felt that I needed to see for myself. Um, I thought to myself that it was clearly an oversight uh, and it was a type of thing that I, I found was it left a lot to be desired because I think that we have to be a whole lot more careful than that. I don't necessarily know that it is sending a signal that we don't want LGBT people, but what it does is sends a signal that we define family in a certain way, we define marriage and spousal associations in a certain way, we define uh, cohabitation, domestic cohabitation, which is recognized in Barbados, we define that in a way that does not include the LGBT community. So if you want to come as an LGBT person, you'll be coming on less favorable terms. So if you're a member of a family, then you'll pay more uh, for each of you to come individually. Uh, in my opinion, that's un un unacceptable. And, and it was against that background that I made my post in, you know, I raised concerns about the fact that this was, was what was happening. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> sorry. I subsequently discovered that, <coughs> I'm sorry. I subsequently discovered that it was um, essentially the policy was gender neutral. As it was explained to me, the policy was gender neutral. There was no need to specify anything other than that it could be the person's spouse or partner. Uh, or it could be a person with whom they had lived with for um, five years for the last year of being together. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. But the important point is that there was no need for that definition. That definition was pulled from the, from the Family Law Act, which is of mm -hmm. the 1980s vintage and, and also needs to be addressed. But in the meantime, that was where it came from. And I guess someone <clears throat> felt it was important to define it in that way. Uh, and, and that was where we are. So <clears throat> against that background, I'm happy that Prime Minister Motley has spoken to the issue, has clarified it, and also has spoken to the broader need for a conversation about same-sex relationships and where they are going. Uh, but more importantly, she has said in the short term, we, we will be having employment rights legislation. Uh, and I am excited about that because I think the employment rights opportunity gives us a chance to, to deal with discrimination in a comprehensive way, not only in terms of discrimination on the basis of, 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 um, of sex, sorry, of sexual orientation, but discrimination on the basis of gender, discrimination on the basis of, of race, 
discrimination on the basis of um, size, size acceptance, you know, because we, we have a lot of that, and also the dis disabilities. So it gives us an opportunity to have a comprehensive conversation about um, discrimination, and certainly the LGBT community would need to be included in that there. So I think it's a progressive step. It, it was an unfortunate uh, situation, but I think that some good has come of it. <clears throat> okay, thanks for that, Peter. And Michael, as a representative of the LGBT organization in Barbados, what were some of the community responses that you received around the subject? Um, well, from what I was seeing on social media, you know, persons were after, it was more like after it was addressed. I mean, everyone had the same sort of response in regards to, oh, look at the language used. This just speaks to, you know, the attitudes towards the community in general. But then after it was spoken to, it's just like, okay, great. So, you know, we're talking about being more accepting to those coming here. What, what, why are we not talking about, you know, how are we are protecting the locals here in Barbados? Um, and while she did speak to Bill, um, you know, that's, that's one aspect of where discrimination comes from. So, you know, even though it's a step forward, but um, yeah, it's, it's one step forward and, you know, people, you know, are affected very negatively in, in all aspects of their life and home. In... Right, we're just having feedback somewhere. I'm not sure where yet. Okay. But continue but on. Continue on, Mike. Um, uh, in school, at home, um, yes, in the workplace, but even, you know, walking around, um, accessing public transportation, you know, many people suffer from mental illnesses such as depression and suicidal thoughts due to the stigma and discrimination. Um, but I do think that the discussion is uh, timely and appropriate because especially now a lot of the um, community are out of work, being that um, a lot of persons lost their jobs with COVID-19 um, because a lot of the community actually works in the tourism industry, hotels, hospitality, restaurants, customer service. We did a survey recently. 35% um, of those who responded um, have been out of work completely and another 25% have been reduced hours. So that's already like 60% of the community that's out of work. So I think that, you know, if this bill does get passed, or hopefully when it gets passed, um, that will, you know, have a positive impact on at least their livelihood in that aspect. Okay, and actually I'm gonna come back to you on that in a bit. So Maria, as a communications person and working for an umbrella organization, a regional umbrella organization, when we see international stories being run, like the one that was in Living Loud 2.0, how does that impact us as an LGBT community? and also to as a wider community in general. It's um, a really good discussion and I'm happy that we're able to have it so quickly um, uh, following the actual events, let's just call them events that transpired. And it highlights again this kind of precarious position that we have in the region. On the one hand, uh, we, we must be self-directed in our advocacy we need to know the priorities of our um, community. We need to have a strategy based on our context, based on the people that we're trying to serve. That is unequivocal. We also have to manage this, um, this myth that is often put forward, as, uh, particularly by the religious right that suggests that um, homosexuality, transgenderism, is something that is, or um, being transgender is something that is imported into the region from, from foreigners. So when something like this happens, again, you have all of that context coming to bear. You know that it can be utilized in the sense that, okay, here are these foreigners again trying to direct advocacy in the region. And here are the local people responding only because the foreigners said so. Unfortunately, Mia Motley's comments are being taken in that context of, to a great extent, being taken in that context of you are responding simply because tourists and foreigners are involved. You are not responding because you have any concern for local people. At the same time, there really was, I mean, given the, the, the situation and the, the island depends so heavily on tourism, there really was, was no other option. It is welcomed, however, in the sense that um, it has prodded government to speak on the issue. They have not spoken um, extensively 
it's not completely satisfying, but it definitely is a start. And it's, I think it's an opportunity for us to take that, um, that, that opening and push the door even wider. They spoke about, um, she spoke about uh, protections in, in, in labor. St. Lucia has protections, those protections, those labor protections. However, the manner in which it, written, it is written is very important. So it's wanting to say that it's another thing to pass a bill that is truly inclusive. And while labor is just one area of people's life, it's a start, but it cannot at the moment be restricted to that because considering that St. Lucia has had that legislation for quite a few years, to come down and say that's all Barbados in particular, which is often a beacon in the Caribbean um, for being a progressive country and having very progressive minded um, citizens to come and just do that bare minimum, which is, it is really considered a bare minimum at, minimum at this point. It really um, would not put the country in such a great light in that this has been done by others before. This is the bare minimum. This is just like, uh, it, it almost seems like a token at this point. And in St. Lucia, from my knowledge, while this, this law has not really been applied, we had a few cases when I worked with United and Strong, which is the local LGBTQI representative organization, we did have cases that were brought to us by the community of individuals who were unfairly dismissed and who wanted to use that aspect um, of the law to defend the case. But it was very difficult, not only in the sense of using legislation that is new, and that you are um, basically being the one to initiate the use of it, but also because the individuals who are at the core of the issue face the risk of being further outed. And if, whether or not they actually are LGBTQ people or whether there's a perception of it by bringing forth a case of wrongful, um, wrongful dismissal based on sexual orientation, you now have this spotlight on you. You now have people asking, oh, is this person really gay? So then they have that, that um, threat, that quote unquote threat of um, publicity or being in the public eye as something um, that they now have to worry about. So it's been, it's that alone, is some, it's, it, there's so much to be considered in just having legislation, whether or not it will be utilized. So that it's, that, first of all, just having that one piece of legislation, not enough. Secondly, it, it should not be in a vacuum. And there are other considerations, including the safety and security of citizens to be taken into consideration, discrimination which is rife within um, society generally, apart from the workplace. All of these things must be taken into account. But we, at the same time, as Caribbean people, have to own the advocacy that we have seen it necessary to do. And we have to speak up, not just as LGBTQI representative organizations, as LGBTQI people, but as allies who um, may not only be I'm interested in the topic for financial gain. So right now, people in the tourism industry come out and speak you like, are you only speaking now because this is about you losing money? So then you yeah. are basically um, uh, watering down your support of the issue. And again, going back to this topic of, are you really concerned about local people? Or are you doing this because you are looking at the bottom line? Yeah, and thank you for that, Maria. And off of what Maria just said, Michael, I. I know Equals is involved in some way in conversation with the Minister of Labor. And it was really good that, you know, there was this mention that there's going to be a bill, as, as Peter had mentioned, you know, no discrimination against race, age, color, gender, sexual orientation, etc. How has your organization, sorry, how has your organization been involved? And what discussions have you had with the Minister of Labor on the bill that's supposed to come to Parliament? Uh, well, we, when, when was it? A couple of years ago, uh, uh, early 2018, I think just as the, um, the new, minister, the new um, uh, Parliament got elected, we sent out letters to a couple of the ministries that, you know, really had an effect on the community and he was one that responded. So in, I think it was November, 2018, uh, myself and Raven Gill, uh, who is also the founder of another organization, Butterfly, um, spoke to him um, and we, we got a chance to uh, air our grievances and our concerns about the community in the workplace. And we also talked about the same bill because it was actually something that was in the works since um, since the last government was was in house, 
Um, so, but the thing is with that, uh, we had some allies in the HIV um, commission who were back and forth with this bill as well. And they kept trying to put um, sexual orientation and gender identity in. And every time it was reviewed, it would come back to them with it out. Um, so we're very happy that this, the, the, uh, the minister, this new minister now um, has, you know, kept at least sexual orientation in. Um, and upon reading the bill, it seems to indirectly talk uh, to gender identity and gender expression. Um, even though obviously we would rather that it did speak directly to gender identity. Um, so we had those discussions. So I'm glad to see, I think that, you know, having that sit down definitely positively impact that coming into effect due to the fact that it was in and out all the time with the new, um, with the old, sorry, the old government. So, you know, um, we're very pleased about that. And, and, you know, I really, I do respect um, the minister, um, Colin Jordan, because uh, he did actually come up to me at a UN event and, and made sure that I knew that, you know, the bill was there. It included sexual orientation. It was going into the house at some point. Um, so I'm glad that, you know, he was actively making sure that, you know, I, I was updated as well. Um, even though I haven't been able to get in contact with him recently, um, obviously that's a bit more difficult with the COVID pandemic having happened. Um, it was his, it was his assistant who um, let me know that the bill was in house. Unfortunately, it's been in house for like over three months now. Of course, COVID-19 has had the, um, has had the minister, the government. Um, it's taken priority. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, again, I'm hoping and I think, you know, they're going to look at it. I hope they're going to look at it. You know, um, Mia mentioned it, but I hope that they're not going to look at it in another, you know, month and a half time. I, I do hope that it's, it's a priority now um, for them on their agenda. And I hope that it gets passed. Um, so, yeah, looking forward to, to at least something positive happening soon. And I do as well. Thanks for that, Michael. And Peter, in the speech um, the PM made to the country, she mentioned that Barbados has welcomed people for decades and centuries and hasn't been that person and has made people feel comfortable. I know you, you have done research in the past on how Barbadians view homosexuality or their views on homosexuality. So is that narrative accurate? And does Barbados openly welcome the LGBTQ plus visitor and also to how are the attitudes towards LGBTQ persons living here from your research perspective and analysis? You're mute. You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that, yeah. Um, right, no, I mean, what, what you're saying is, is, is accurate, and I would say that that is, is, is extremely good and extremely bad at the same time. I mean, you know, Maria's point about Barbados being a beacon in the region in relation to these matters, has a lot to do with the fact that it has always seen to be a progressive society. I remember some time ago when Ralph Gonzalez did his, his, um, his uh, book on the Caribbean civilization, one of the points he made about Barbados is that he's always been fascinated by the extent to which the average Barbadian is a lot more liberal on issues of human sexuality than, than is the case in, in places like Jamaica, for example. Um, certainly the surveys I would have done across the region uh, would have suggested that Barbados has one of the lowest levels of homophobia and, and is ironically close to that of Suriname, which is a Dutch colony that has, uh, sorry, a Dutch country that has decriminalized uh, many years ago. Um, th so so the, the reality is a good one in the sense that the average Barbadian is nearly not that homophobic. The level of homophobia in Barbados is low and it's one of the lowest in the regions. It's good and bad. The, the bad part about it is that it has led people to this belief that we do not have a problem and then there is really no reason why you need to worry because all is well in Barbados. And you know, it's a comment that I receive from people all the time. You know? So if, if you can't demonstrate that this is a high level of homophobia, what's the problem? Um, yeah, I mean, homosexuality is illegal, but that is observed in the breach more than anything else because the reality is that, you know, people, uh, people are, are gay and they, they don't be, they're not treated badly. Um, my, my concern, however, is that I always tell people, you know what, it's not about my experience. It is about the experience of a lot of people who are less fortunate, for whom their sexuality is used as a weapon to beat them. Um, in a situation where there's nothing else to hold on to. And, and I think that that's really where we have to go. So um, I would agree that Barbados has a responsibility to be progressive. Um, we are helped by the fact that the local community is relatively comfortable with the idea. 
uh, but it is also a hindrance in the sense that it sends a signal to people that, that we don't have a problem. Um, there's an elephant in the room though, Rene, and I, I would argue that in, in all of this, the challenge is that you can speak to uh, discrimination in the workplace. The fact that there's not a lot of it means that the legislation will pass relatively easy. But there's always concern that when you allow um, language like that to sneak into regular legislation, bearing in mind that in Barbados, you can, you can alter the constitution of Barbados without necessarily having to declare that you're altering the constitution. So in a, in a sense, if you take a, a bill to parliament now, which um, alters, which introduces this whole idea of freedom from discrimination on the basis of employment, uh, and it has the support of all of the members of parliament who support government, which is essentially, you know, all but one of them. Yeah. Um, ultimately, the constitution has changed if, if, if that is the problem. And, and I think that for a number of people, that raises concern because they believe, well, if you change the constitution, if you decriminalize buggery through the back door, so to speak, and that's a, an unfortunate phrase I'm using, but um, if you do that, um, what impact does it have on same-sex marriage? And, and that's something where a lot of people seem to feel that that is the, the ground zero to the point where a number of gay people don't even support same-sex marriage. And, and the feeling is that if you allow for the introduction of those kinds of conversations, that it is the end of civilization and that Barbados will become an immoral society and you know, all of these kinds of conversations, which are not grounded in anything real, but it's really all about people's perceptions. So I, I have come to a stage where I am comfortable with the idea of us moving in terms of making these steps that, you know, knock away at the, the fundamentals, um, while bearing in mind that we have a broader concern, which is the fact that we maintain buggery laws, which are archaic, which are offensive and need to be spoken to. Uh, and the issue of, of same-sex marriage is also one that is, um, is, is it needs to be uh, addressed at some stage. And I, I accept that the community is not necessarily of one mind in this regard. But I do feel that it's an option that has to be created for some people. And, and we've gotten to a stage now where we're saying, well, if it is that we're not going to allow for our own marriages, then we will respect other people. So if I go to St. Lucia and get married to, to Michael, uh, can I come back to Barbados and have that respected? And I think that that's probably where the conversation is now. And maybe um, there will be a, a greater level of comfort with that as opposed to the, the idea of, of um, us having marriages ourselves. But the, I mean, the reality is there are a number of Barbadians, including yourself, yeah. that are married mm -hmm. to and have, are in same sex marriages. And I don't think we, this ad addresses persons applying that are visiting, but we haven't had a situation mm -hmm. where it addresses a, a national with their spouse coming in and mm -hmm. saying, well, this is my partner. Can I recognize this person as a Barbadian resident and citizen through our marriage? Mm -hmm. Actually, it's an uh, ex-wife of a Barbadian can apply probably for residency easier than the same-sex partner. And that's a discussion that we truly have to have. And I, I think we just haven't had someone test it. Maybe someone should test it with having their spouse apply for Barbadian <laughs> residency or citizenship. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's a, that's a, a, it's a conversation that's ongoing in, in terms of, of my own situation. Um, you know, my, my view on it is that if, if I can use my situation in any way to advance the cause nationally, I am comfortable with that. At the same time, however, if by advancing that cause, it will cause more damage than good, then I'm not prepared to go ahead with it. Um, my partner is not particularly keen on, well, I should say he's not keen. He, he, he's comfortable in terms of whatever statement I want to make, and that's fine. But in terms of actually living in Barbados, there's, there's no desire right now to live beyond the, the time that we have already lived. Um, and that's, you know, that's the reality of it. At the same time, however, you, you're right that if the option, if you want to, to, to pursue that option, you should be able to. Um, we have had chances and opportunities in the past where same-sex couples have come to Barbados in the diplomatic community, and, and they have addressed it discreetly in, in terms of what the Barbados authorities will do. And my sense is that were I to make a fuss about the fact that my partner wanted to live in Barbados indefinitely, it may very well be addressed through similar mechanisms that was used for the ambassadors, deputy ambassadors, political officers, and others that have come with their partners. So there's a, there's a feeling that we can deal with these things quietly and you know, not to make a fuss because you don't want to offend anyone. But I do feel that 
you know, sometimes to make eggs, you have to break, to make omelets, you have to break some eggs. And, and, and there will come a time when we can't just do this patchwork and say, okay, we will deal with employment discrimination. We will deal with, with your situation. You know, you don't have anything to worry about. We will take care of you. Where you create a, an environment where the whole population is able to benefit from these things. One of the things we have to remember, Rene, is that the, the older generation, especially, I don't think the younger ones are particularly fussed about these issues, but the older generation is spooked by the idea of two men and two women getting married. They're spooked by the idea of gay relationships being normal, and they're even more spooked by the idea of trans men and women um, presenting themselves as such and forming relationships with others. The whole thing is, is spooky. I've taken a position that we need to help demystify that experience and we need to help people understand that by virtue of the fact that I am married to a man, it doesn't really change anything. And I'm so happy that over the past year, you know, uh, I've been married and I have engaged in conversations of a political nature in matters relating to all kinds of things that have had nothing to do with sexuality. And, you know, the, the conversation can still be as robust. Yeah. I think that that helps because people seem to feel that once two men get married, the, the, the world stops spinning. If we can get to a stage where we can communicate to that population that really it doesn't change anything. You can still believe in God. You can still go to church. You're still entitled to your own views. You yourself don't have to get married to a person of the same sex if you don't want to. But someone else can get on with their life. And, and you know, it's essentially everybody can live and be happy. Uh, once you can demonstrate that the, the pie does not get smaller because human race is not like pie, everybody can get yeah. some. Then, and and, you know, and also be... too though, Peter, the reality is for a lot of the organizations and communities in the Eastern Caribbean, that includes Barbados, marriage is not on the narrative, like the major yeah, issue on the narrative that. for yeah. them. The, the issues for most persons are issues of discrimination maybe in the workplace, removing the buggery law, how they navigate healthcare. So I know this cultural idea that the society will fall apart because there are certain rights given to LGBT persons and it automatically leads to marriage is one that is it's like a phantom ghost out there that is really not if you look at it for most community members their burning issue or, or problem but um, I'm gonna just move on um, quickly to Maria because we're running out of time so Maria I know that Social media has been used quite a lot recently to bring a lot of these issues to the forefront. And when I see how quickly the, the narrative of that being posted and then within a day, this whole conversation happened and then you have them, uh, having to have actual persons respond government-wise to it. How does government or government should really moving forward, how, do, how should government moving forward look at engaging community and also using social media in your opinion as a, a person working in public relations because it is something that we can't ignore before we would kind of say you know social media it's not advocacy on social media is not as important but advocacy is quickly moving to social media and then leaping into the everyday world or um i mean i will not presume to your governments how to use the social media. <laughs> well, I'm not saying that yes, but we, were, we still realize I have to monitor it somehow. Yes, I know, I know what you say. Um, but we, it, it's, it has been shown to be very helpful. We had the, the Cambridge Analytica scandal that showed that um, utilizing social media to get information and to, um, at the very worst, manipulate people is something that can backfire but it can be extremely, um, in, extremely effective for the people who can afford to use it. However, the core of it is um, government understanding what it is that their populace wants, but also having that determination to work in the interests of, um, of your community. Like Peter mentioned earlier, to, um, to put laws in place that serve the entire community. The example you used of people of a certain, um, economic bracket, being able to uh, live in the manner that they would want to and be able to manipulate the system or organize the system around their lives, that's fantastic for them. 
However, for the ordinary person, somebody who may come to the, let's in the since we're using the, the example of, of um, tourism, somebody who may come, who may have a, a, um, a common law spouse, as we call it in the Caribbean, the Caribbean recognizes common law spouses. However, when you are in a situation of a, a crisis and emergency, that must be acknowledged. How is that acknowledged by the country in which you, you are currently resident? Um, and how do you navigate around that? So when you look at, okay, certain people have been able to live like that, and so it's not a problem. No, these are people who have a certain level of privilege, right? So government is there to level the playing field. So government must find ways to hear the, to hear the voices of everybody. Peter is in the job, is, you know, is in the... Um, is in the, the job of, of doing that, of using those surveys, using those means to get at the core, but not using it in a way that you now use it to get to your aims and to get to your goals, but using the manner that serves the society generally. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a very solid platform on which to, to, to decide to um, enact laws that benefit your society. It's there and it's been there for a very good reason. It hasn't been um, changed for a very good reason because at the core of it, that's what we want. We're in a society where every person's, every person's in its humanity is recognized and is respected and that laws are put into place to ensure that nobody else violates those individuals' rights. And I think everybody, from government's point of view, the one way they can communicate to the populace is that we are not, as Peter said earlier, it's not a pie that if I give this person, if I recognize the, this person's full human rights, that you're going to lose your rights. No, it's a balance that we have to preserve, we have to maintain for the good of everybody. And um, this again, just highlights how much humanity is interconnected, right? Whatever happens and that affects one group of people, there will be ripples that will affect everybody else. And when we look at it in a vacuum of, oh, these are the gay people, and then you, could, you, know, you don't have to worry about their rights, etc. You do, because it affects you. It affects your life. The power, your, and you have to really stop and think about how it affects um, your day-to-day, your -day, as well as your pocket, which is what a lot of people, the, the, the impact that a lot of people seem to, that seem to um, move a lot of people. How does it affect your, your bottom line? How does it affect the economy? How does it affect your pocket? So even if we have to look at it from that perspective and government can say, okay, this is what is of concern to my population and this is how I need to address it, right? But at the core of it, they need to find out really what people think, not in the, in the sense of utilizing that to manipulate people, but in the sense of utilizing that to see where do we need to make change to educate our people, to inform them, to let them know how the decision that we take affects the entire community and not just use that as a means of, um, in the worst way, holding on to power and manipulating people to keep voting you back into power without recognizing and caring for the most marginalized people in your community and the people who are, who are economically at least at the bottom of the ladder, but who are certainly not in the sense of being human beings and being um, entitled to every single right that any other human being is. They are not at the bottom of the ladder and we must take this into account because in the long run, it is not to our benefit. Yeah. Well, again, thanks for that, Maria. So I'm going to go into last words. I'm going to start with Peter, then Maria, then Michael. So Peter. Right, mute. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, I like the idea of, of ending on the same point that Prime Minister Molly ended, where we use this whole Black Lives Matter movement and we, hold, we look at the whole movement where we say that, you know, everyone has to be able to breathe. And I think that if we try to create a world in which everyone can breathe, the, the overweight or obese, the uh, disabled, the homosexual, the transgender, uh, the women, the men, if everyone can breathe, I think everyone is happy. And that's what I am in support of fully, that we use these opportunities to create a world in which we all can breathe and we all can breathe equally. Great, great, thanks for that. Um, Maria, your last words? Definitely building up on, on that position. And from the, the point of view of using media, I think we need to use media more to educate and inform people and to broaden, people, broaden people's perspectives, broaden their worldview, 
it doesn't mean that we are seeking to change who they are as an individual, but convey to them how their lives and the decision that they take, the decision that is taken by government affects all of us because we are all like um, the Universal Declaration says, um, with regards to our rights, right? We are the indivisible and interconnected. We are as human beings, interconnected and indivisible. We cannot really live without our lives having an effect on somebody else. So in terms of, from the position of, 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 of media, ensuring that government should look to utilize media to inform and educate and sensitize and raise awareness. And we as activists, we as advocates, need to, again, reach out to each other, not just utilize media in our own little space and just have our, vo our voice out in the void, but to connect with each other, which Rene does very effectively online as well, connect with each other, share each other's voices, um, um, amplify each other's voices and help to spread that message and raise awareness of people that we as human beings at the, at the core, diversity is just part of the world. It's part of humanity, it's part of the animal kingdom, it's part of nature. So we must respect that diversity and we must in our own way ensure, even if you simply put a post on Facebook, you speak to your government, you make that be part of your voting decision, but we must also utilize our voice to ensure that we, as much as possible, achieve equality for everybody. Thanks, Maria. And Michael, your last words? Um, I agree with the with others on their points. Uh, I think, you know, it, it's a step-by-step -step process. Again, as you've mentioned, you know, I don't think that a lot of persons are in the community are, you know, clamoring for, for marriage, but they are interested in not being discriminated anymore. Um, the, the employment bill is one step towards it, and we intend to utilize that platform to sort of help educate and sensitize the wider community going forward as well, so that, you know, we can at least help reduce the discrimination in some areas of person's lives, but also use the opportunity to help sensitize so that those who are sensitized within those areas and educate those who, you know, who they interact with and um, we can get one step closer to a more inclusive society. And thank you for that, Michael. And again, everyone, thank you for joining us. And I'm sure that this conversation will continue not just here off of this video, but I see it still happening on various social media platforms and in the regular media as well. Because as I mentioned today, there is an article in Barbados Today where Peter speaks to it as um, with, I can't remember his name, is Kareem. Kareem, yeah. Kareem. Yeah, Kareem. Yeah. And, and, one of the things that for me, and I'll add my last words, is that we live in a time where the traditional ways of putting news out there has changed. So you can just simply put up a form and that takes on a life of its own. It has its own news cycle that was spoken about for 24 hours. And then we see government responding and I'm thankful quickly and appropriately to the issue. But I also have my concerns in the sense that that was one step and I'm hearing everybody speak to the, oh, that was done because there's a profit line here. It's about tourism and you're not doing enough for what's happening locally. So I hope that the bill that's talked about, that is a, a step, but we know there's a lot more to be done. And I hope that this government will continue to work with people and also realize that they have to listen and that that communication continues to happen between its citizens. So again, thank you. And it's been great talking with you all.